thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, we have two speakers from the University of Michigan, uh, Ed Cologne and Craig Maxfield, and they are going to be going over a persona related topic today, specifically uh, mobile persona devices that they've deployed in and around their campus to assist with measurements and debugging. So I will turn it over to Ed and Craig. Thank you. Um, as uh, we were introduced, uh, we are here to talk about Persona. My name is Craig Maxfield. I'm a senior uh, network analyst with the University of Michigan. And then I'm here with Ed Colon, who is a senior, sorry, a senior software engineer at the university. And we work under Eric Boyd, director of networks, again, here at the University of Michigan. Next slide. Give you a little background, a little history of why we've done this. Uh, currently, our core network is 100 gig between the various core nodes um, out to the bin. And then we have over 200 various buildings. Um, most, a lot of them are at 10 gig uplinks. Some have one gig. Um, they all have dual uplinks to the core. Some are to our cool and then our FXB. Some are to our LSA our SEB, which are different core routers, and then those um, connect to Arbin Arbel and or Arbin SEB, and that's where we go from there. Um, we have a mix of fiber, of SR and LR fiber, um, basically different length of fiber capabilities, um, a little more specifics like that. We have 10 gig testing, that we do for the campus, for the backbone. Basically, we have some perf sonar boxes in the core. We have a few sitting, I believe, on the bin. We have, they're, they're interspersed all over the place. We have them at data centers. Um, but those are more static perf sonar test points. Those are on server class and, uh, hardware. Those are in data centers. They're very big, they're very bulky. Great for testing the network, great for testing the overall health of the network, but they don't do good with testing the size, testing where we might have a potential issue. Um, where it's very inconsistent. Some departments have deployed them all over the place on their nets. Some of them have no, nothing. Some of them have absolutely no visibility into their actual daily capabilities, their actual daily speeds that they are uh, getting. So they don't know if they're getting one gig or 10 gig. We have some locations where they are, uh, where there's 10 gig to the network, 10 gigs from the desktop, typically researchers. Um, and what ends up happening is we get a, a phone call from a researcher and says, my network is slow. And we ask them to, expand on that and they say sure my network is slow and so we need to start figuring out is it a desktop issue is it a network issue is it a wi-fi issue um, is it even between the, is it, where is it between them and the, the server they're trying to reach um, and so this is kind of how we resolved one very unique issue um, where we ended up figuring out we had multiple stuff going on, multiple issues going on. Um, but this kind of helped us really build up our mobile testing platform here. Next slide. Okay, so before we go any further, uh, I have to give some disclaimers. First off, uh, Perf Sonar as a project does not endorse any particular hardware vendor uh, or platform. Uh, we're platform agnostic. If you can get it to run on your platform and you're happy with the tests measurements it's making, we're happy for you. Uh, the other thing is that this is definitely an anecdotal talk. We're going to talk about um, techniques that we developed and um, lessons that we've learned. Uh, we offer this up to the community. Uh, hopefully you can learn from our experiences and our mistakes. But if you break it, you've bought both pieces. So your mileage may vary. Uh, so, Craig gave us an overview of the uh, large scale problem space that we have at the University of Michigan. Um, so, 
the first thing is, is historically, like Craig said, we've put in our main data centers and next to our core routers, some server class hardware to run Personar as a 10 gig test point. Um, we bought a couple years ago, some Dell R330s. They are a one U four post rack server. So it's definitely data center hardware. Um, they're really thin or they're, you know, they're not very tall because they're less than two inches tall, but they're the size of a very, very large pizza box. And it also sounds like a small aircraft when it's uh, going full bore. So it's a very loud, very obtrusive pizza box. Um, it weighs 30 pounds. If we wanted, Craig can attest, Craig lugged uh, two of these uh, up and down stairs into a, the basement of a hundred year old built campus building. Um, and they're also uh, quite expensive. They're uh, not insignificant. They're tricked out the way we have them without optics. They're about $2,700. They're really nice data center servers. They're not great. On a, the professor was not very excited to see one of these on his desk. And we were not excited to have to like basically put these on a dirt floor in the basement of a hundred year old campus building that basically didn't have much rack space in their period. Wasn't designed for that a hundred years ago, surprisingly. So we need portability. We wanted something that had a good form factor, reasonable in cost. Um, it needed to do 10 gig testing. That was one of the major qualifications. Uh, it does one gig testing, that's great. We expected that, but it had to do 10. Um, it also, the hardware had to run a Personar supported operating system, CentOS 7 or Ubuntu. Uh, and that was kind of the hard requirements, but we also had some other niceties that we were looking for. Uh, if it had an out of band management port, that makes life easier for us in a lot of different ways. So that was, that was nice. Um, we were also hoping to find something that we could run power over ethernet. Unfortunately, all of the machines in this class, not a single one of them can run over power over ethernet. So that just kind of went by the wayside. It'd be nice if, if uh, when we were in a data center, if we could have the option to rack mount these, um, it'd be nice if they were, you know, expandable. So not necessarily future proofed, but you know, they're not going to be end of life in a year or two. And I was hoping that they'd be x86 based because I've got experience running ARM processors with Personar and um, they don't really have great CentOS support for all the packages yet. So I was hoping that if we were running an x86 platform, then we could run CentOS like our core machines and we have some CentOS experience in house and we wouldn't have to support two different operating systems because um, we would have ran Ubuntu on ARM if we would have ran an ARM. It wasn't a deal breaker. It was just yet again, another nicety. So enter the Supermicro E308D. Uh, it is a small little machine. You can take two of these and you can put them in your backpack and you can go in and out of campus and, not, and no one even knows you have two computers in your backpack. Uh, it has facilities for two SFP plus optics. Um, it has a ton of one gig interfaces. It's got six of them. It's got an out of band interface. Um, it's processor. The only thing I really truly would care about with the processor is that it's fast enough. And for what we're doing so far, the four cores at 2.2 gigahertz each is fast enough. It does a 10 gig throughput test, which is what we're looking for. Uh, it has eight gig of RAM. It has a half a terabyte of SSD. It's quite quick. And uh, despite all those uh, very interesting features that clocks in at less than a grand without optics. So uh, you can buy a few of these uh, for your mobile test points very affordably. Now, I don't have experience with this because we haven't done this yet, but the menu, some of the resellers also offer PCI expansion options where you can add on more one gig ports, more uh, 10 gig SFP ports, and then there was a couple of them that offered two by 25 gig cards in there. Uh, obviously, form factor is an issue, but um, it's, it seems like you can get that sort of card in there. So I would assume that the machine and the hardware is probably able to support it. I have no direct experience with it yet, though. So uh, once we had a few of the, we bought two of them to start with. We wanted to do an evaluation. And bootstrapping was a pretty straightforward process. I brought him into the lab. I had a crash cart with a VGA and USB keyboard. We hooked him up. 
uh, from there is able to set up the firmware settings because the uh, SSD is an NVMe hard drive. Uh, we had to use UEFI and not BIOS. So we had to set that up uh, with the crash court. I set up the out of band management port with the IP addresses that Craig uh, supplied me. And then once I was there, I was able to get onto the out of band management um, and in, you know install the OS off of an ISO that I had on my machine. And then I was able to configure the network. And once I had uh, the network configured, I could provision accounts so I could log in and then I could provision it with uh, Ansible. So that's what I did. I made a standalone Ansible inventory. I put this machine in it and I told it that I wanted this to be a test point and it went ahead and installed it for me. It was pretty straightforward. Um, now, the one last thing is that our testing so far has been pretty straightforward out of the box persona testing. We haven't had to get really crazy with UDP or anything, um, but if you did, you can configure persona on the machine with a limits file so that you can tell it to trust other hosts that make requests to it. So if you have a number of these machines and you want them to make outrageous requests to each other, like allow me to flood the network with UDP packets, uh, you, can, you can modify your restrictions on your persona limits file and allow that to happen. Conversely, if you're worried about that sort of activity, you can actually uh, use the limits file to restrict testing even further. So um, the other, the other goal of this is to make this as turnkey as possible for the text in the field. So um, Mr. Uh, Jeff uh, Bagley or, uh, or Hagley came up with a very interesting solution here. Um, he showed us how to use a bonded interface with CentOS and he showed us uh, how to use an active backup scheme. So uh, when the interfaces are put in this sort of bonded um, configuration, uh, we can run a network. Our, our usage case is to run a single network cable from the uh, device under test to our test point. And in this instance, we could run a one gig copper cable to one of the one to the ENO5 interface. Um, we have a short range optic in ENO7, which is our primary interface. And then we have uh, a long range optic in ENO8. So you could run fiber or a copper cable over to this, plug it into the appropriate one, and the operating system figures out which interface it should use. Uh, we tested this. Uh, one, of the con one of the concerns is this is another you know, chance for a performance decrease. And, and you really want your test equipment to have the highest performance possible because that's what's going to give you the best view of your network. So we tested this with an interface bond and without the interface bond, and we got basically the same results. So the interface bond, we have confidence that it's not interfering with the test at all. Uh, and then let's see here. This is uh, how our back of the device looks. We have our one gig out of band management platform. Uh, I have the three interfaces bonded together so that the field text can go and plug in to the correct optic or into the copper port the way they want through IJ and K. Uh, they're all handled through the same IP address. So when we extend the network, we only have one IP address to worry about, not three to have to pick from. And then I also, because I am not a network expert and I don't know how to extend the network like that. I've configured interface D to be straight DHCP. So when I need to bring one of these into my lab for service or upgrades, I can just plug it straight into the DHCP on one of my switches. And then I can be back up and running without having to worry about, um, you know, extending VLANs or anything that I actually don't know how to do. So uh, we have a security architecture. Um, all of these machines are restricted to a bastion host for SSH. And it's possible to limit persona testing via the limits file to just that persona or P scheduler server as well. We have not elected to that yet, but that's a possibility. Um, so that way you could use the BAST. You can, what you can basically do is you can hand a pair of these to a network tech, give them an account on the Bastion server. They can put these in the field and then use the Bastion server to issue P scheduler commands to the two devices that they have in the server closet with them. And they don't even need accounts on that on those two devices. P scheduler figures all that out for them and orchestrates the test and gives them the results back on that Bastion server. 
Um, now, if you did want them to have accounts, you can give them SSH, SSH keys over there. And uh, it's very secure. They have to have um, an account on that bastion. It's got a two-factor authentication to get there. Um, if you're off campus, you need to go through a VPN and then you need an SSH key on the Supermicro. So there, this is how we do our field deployments. So there's a measure of security, even though these are mobile and they're getting set up all over campus. And I'll turn this one over to Craig. Thanks. So we had a couple of options that we, uh, we considered for the network size. So slash 29 gives you a total of eight, access, eight IPs. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, you burn two of those immediately with the network and the broadcast. Um, those are basically uh, homework IPs. Or, so we have six usable. Uh, you lose two on the network, so you have six usable. And the way we set our network up, the first IP of the, of the network is the gateway. So we have to make sure we have a gateway, and we know that we need to have at least one test point to have an IP address for this to even be usable. So right there, we would require four. However, some of our locations, some of our buildings, we have two DLs or two routers. And those two routers then have a, uh, kind of think of it like a floating IP where that's the gateway. So the way that we've got our network set up is we have the gateway IP in this instance, uh, 0.1. The first DL that we want to make sure that if we need to test, we can has a 0 0.2, and then the second one is 0 0.3. So with that burning up three, we knew we could not use a slash 30. So we went to a slash 29, which gives us a total of eight IP addresses. What we also did is we have approximately 12 total of these super micro machines. And so we've taken two of them and making them a pair. So we have boxes one and two with bonded IP addresses. Uh, the first one is 0 0.4 and the second one is 0 0.5. That allows us to do some testing where if we want to test only on a particular switch, we can stay on that switch. We don't have to leave the switch at all um, because it's in the same network. It's in the same what they call broadcast domain. So because of that, we can do testing, we can test an individual switch. Um, we can also bring a, a box from another pair and then we can have two separate networks and it'll force it to go through the gateway for the routing between the two machines. So this gives us a lot of flexibility in our capability. This really gives us the ability to kind of design a test or envision a test how we want it and we can just grab a box and make it happen. And that was extremely important to us because we wanted to do as little work on the actual box as necessary so we can kind of keep them in the same expected design. Um, and that way we can grab them, use them, put them back, and then we can use them again later if necessary. Next slide. So we have a couple of ways that we can do tests. Um, so basically, way we were doing our testing is we use the bastion host and we have a test point. Um, the first thing you do when you, when you go out on site, you have to build your network. These networks are not on site initially. They're not kept there permanently. They move with the box. They move with the, the super micro. And so what this allows us to do is not change the IP on the uh, box. What this forces us to do as network analysts, um, is that we have to build the network on site. It's not difficult, um, but that's one of the, that's kind of the first step is we build it on the gateway, we build it on the router. We then have to stretch that VLAN um, or move that VLAN, uh, bring that VLAN to the access layer that we are actually testing. So most sites, you won't, you won't actually use it on the router. You'll use it on what we call uh, an access layer switch. Um, and that switch doesn't do routing. So you have to basically, it's called trunking the VLAN. We put the, the VLAN tag, or the VLAN number on the port going to the access layer. And that, there's some security there. We only send up the VLANs that we're using. And then we build the VLAN on the, the access layer. We bring that VLAN to the port that we're plugging in the box. 
and then we plug the box in. And that allows us to, um, at that point, have full network connectivity to the box. Once we've done that, we power up the equipment. At that point, we should have connectivity once the equipment's fully powered up. You can ping it. You, know, you should be able to ping it from pretty much anywhere within our network. So then you log into the, the Bastion server, the P scheduler host, and you run your test. So as you can see on the uh, right-hand side here, uh, we're not logged into the box. We're not logged into the individual deployed, uh, uh, excuse me, to the individual uh, super micros. You can see that our source is 137.100 and our destination is 137.101. We've built already on the network through step one, the gateway and the broadcast IP. And that tells us then, that lets us set up our, our switch micro, or super micro, excuse me, to reach the network. So this passion server, which is just a server sitting in a, a data center, is able to reach these on dot 100 and dot 101. So these, in this particular test that we ran, they're actually on a, the same switch. The switch that they're connected to is connected back into the network on a one gig test. But you can see here that we're connecting with a total summary of 9.91 gigabits. The reason that we're able to, to have that is because the traffic, because it's on the same network, does not leave that switch. The, the, we were able to test the connectivity of this particular switch, even though we're on a, a, a lab environment essentially, and this allowed us to um, set this up, test the switch, make sure this switch is giving us our full 10 gigs. Um, the issue that we were trying to fix here was that we had an initial test where we were only getting 6.5 megs on this same exact switch. Um, so this, was, this allows us to see that our, our testing philosophy was, was valid. Our procedure was good. Next slide. So this was, we got a phone call and said, we have a researcher who's on a 10 gigabit desktop machine. He should have 10 gig from his desktop to the remote server in one of our data centers. You should have 10 gig throughput, no problem. And he got the, he did the proverbial, it's slow. And we said, well, we're playing with these personas, let's deploy them. Well, at the time, we only had the Dells. We didn't, the, the big boxes that we initially talked about. We did not have the super micros at the time. We were still in the procurement and verifying everything else stage with them. So what we did, we put one on his desk and we connected it to the same fiber path that his machine was on, which then connects down to the DL, goes through our UM network to the MAC data center where we stuck another one. And we ran the test that night and we got 6.5 megabits. That is approximately 100th the speed that he should expect. We thought we had an issue we thought we had a testing issue, not a network issue. We said, there's no way that's possible. Six gig, four gig, we have a, a network issue normal. 6.5 meg, there's something else going on. We ran the test from the user's desktop, from the Dell on his desktop, to other of our permanent installations. All of them got 6.5, eight megs, I think was our best to say. And we said, there's no way this is actually happening. So we decided we have to go back to square one and we have to verify our boxes. Next slide. So we decided to benchmark everything. Lesson number one, don't carry 30 pound servers out, to a, out on site without actually testing your equipment. So we've, we've done that now. And at the time, we also brought in the super micros. We said they're 30 pounds. It's getting kind of old carrying these. So the first thing we did, we started fresh. We plugged the super micros into each other and we tested our fiber. We tested the boxes themselves. We tested the, they're called SFPs. That's what plugs into the super micro. And then the fiber plugs into that. Um, and 
we got 9.9 gigabits. And we said, something's going weird here. We had them on the same network. Now that's very important. Just like how we put it on the same network so that we can stay on a switch without going off the switch, we can actually take the switch out of the equation, plug the boxes into each other directly. Now, if you do that, you have to run the test on the super micro, but you can still reach it off site uh, through the out of band that is set up. So we have an out of band static, and then we also have a test IP on all of these super micros. So we can plug the out of band into the network. We can then plug the boxes into each other and we can run our tests that way. And that's what we did. And that verified that we were hitting 10 gigabits as expected. So we knew the issue wasn't the boxes at that time. We knew it wasn't fiber or our SFP. We knew it was not an equipment issue. Next slide. So then we said, if it's not the equipment, we're gonna have to test the switch that we were plugged into. With the researcher, the researcher's plugged into a switch. So we took that same switch, we put a new switch in place over there, over at Randall, and we got him, we started seeing better connectivity through the new switch we put in. So we took the switch off that we saw, the 6.5 results, 6.5 meg, and we plugged in. And we were able to find at that time, we were again seeing 6.5 meg. What that allowed us to do then was know that our network switch was the issue. We were able to, at that time, we didn't even have our network switch on the network. Um, we were running the tests by plugging in the out of band into the network, which is just a one gig connection. Um, it's, it's, it's essentially a, a desktop plugged in or a computer plugged into your network. Um, we were doing the same thing, and then we were just logging into the super micro remotely and running the test that way. By doing that, we were able to um, start the process of working with our vendor to figure out what the issue was. Um, and we were able to start running more specific tests. Uh, we hooked up two switches back to back, and we were able to find out that when we sourced it on a particular switch, the 6.5 meg hit. If we reverse the test, we had 10 gigs. And so we were able to take that information and work with the vendor to eventually work out the issue and resolve it. The other nice thing that this particular kind of test does, the nice thing about this sort of uh, testing, if you've got a brand new box, uh, you take it out of the box, uh, you, you receive it from your vendor, and you say, I wanna make sure this thing actually does 10 gig. Um, I don't, I don't trust this vendor or it's a brand new box or something like that. Again, because it does not leave the, the box, you can do testing on that. You can just plug it in and just go, go to and do all of your testing. You can do one gig, 10 gig. Uh, you can verify your hardware and then you can send it out to the field knowing it works. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. I'm trying. One second. Oops, it skipped on me. There we go. All right, there we go. So this is more of what we looked at when we were initially doing the Randall testing. So Randall is a 100-year-old building. The, the building router is in the basement, and it is one of the locations that when we started testing, it had a 10 gig fiber connection to one side of the core. And then due to cost cutting or cost benefits, initially it had a one gig backup link. So the theory was all traffic was supposed to go over the 10 gig, certain traffic, or when the 10 gig went down, the one gig would come into play. And so we wanted to see if maybe that was causing the issue. So. That was one of the main reasons why we deployed the, the PERF sonar boxes out at Randall. During the testing, um, it was decided we would upgrade all you know, campus locations to 10 gig, and we actually got rid of that scenario now. So everything has a 10 gig. If it has a 10 gig primary, it has a, a 10 gig sec secondary or backup. 
But what we wanted to do, because we understood everywhere we went, we had the 6.5 meg results. What we ended up doing is we plugged one of our super micros into the DL router itself, or the DL switch here. And then we also plugged another one into the same access layer switch that the researcher was on. And this allowed us to once again, see where the issue was. We knew that when we originated the test on the super micro that's connected directly to the DL, if we started the test on that one and went to the super micro on the AL switch, we got full 10 gig performance. So we knew we had 10 gig coming in, but when we reversed that test, we had 6.5 meg. And what this caused us to find, what this showed us to find is we knew we had a problem on that switch. And it didn't matter if we, what port we used, we knew it was switched wide, it was not a bad port or anything like that. So the, what this test allowed us to do was find that we had a bad switch. It allowed us to, to work out that we had the switch that was causing issues in our network. Um, the other nice thing that this would allow is if we had a permanent install of perf sonar at Randall, um, what would this allow us to do is plug the super micro, the, the nice light switch that we're using for testing, plug it into the AL, and then we can just connect it and test it against the permanent install. We only got to carry one box and we can validate pretty quickly whether our network is 10 gig capable or not. And then based on those results, we either resolve it or we tell the customer, you got something else going on other than the network. So you can stay on the same network by bringing out one of our pair of super micros, or you can test different networks, which also tests then the routing capabilities of your router. Um, even though it's not leaving the core, the DL switch is still doing routing and therefore it is still testing that capability. Next switch, Another slide. All right, it takes a second now. Last time it jumped on me. There we go. Cool. So finally, we have the ability to test our entire network with these. And what this allows us to do then is, again, bring, at this point, we could just bring just one of our super micros out. We can plug it into the DL directly, or we can plug it into an access layer. And going through our core, going through our network, we can then go to one of our permanent installations. Um, and that would allow us to test and say, yes, this DL is choosing the right link. Say we still had a 10 gig primary, one gig backup. We could have done a super micro on a location there and put another one in a data center or just tested it against one of our uh, permanent insulation for sonars. And that would pretty quickly validate if we're actually using the 10 gig properly. Um, if you are doing the test and you get back one gig, you know you got an issue because uh, per sonar is going, only going, is going to show you what your slowest connection is. If you have a one gig, if you're, if you're going over the one gig backup, you're gonna get one gig performance. So this allows some core testing However, one of the obvious limitations here is our core is now 100 gig. And we're, so when we're talking in the super micro world, we're only able to test that to 10 gig. So we're not doing full core testing, but we are able to test the capability of what our building router or our DL router is capable of um, for the uplink there. So we're able to verify when it goes through a, a particular network, is there a slowness introduced? Uh, one of the things we found later was when it was going through certain firewalls, um, due to packet inspection, it actually slows it down. And so we were able to find that we were not getting full 10 gigabit bandwidth from, uh, again, the user in Randall outside of the firewall network he was on. Uh, it would go through a firewall because it was protected and the deep packet inspection would slow the traffic down. And so we were able to point that out and say, you're not going to get 10 gig if you're trying to, you know, go to Google because it's, it's got the deep packet inspection. But as long as he stayed behind the firewall, we were able to prove that he was 
that the network was capable of 10 gigs. And that's when we found after that, that he'd actually made changes on his desktop just before. And we were able to find what the issue was because he neglected to tell us the, the network changes that he had made trying to speed it up. And he decided that that couldn't be the reason. And so he neglected to tell us um, until we finally proved the network was fully capable of 10 gigs. I, Next slide. Also, yeah. I also wanted to mention, uh, or maybe you should mention how even testing to a data, uh, um, uh, a semi-permanent or permanent install in a data center, you might want to test to the exact rack in a data center. Yeah, so one of the things that he wanted us to test, thank you for that, was, okay, so even if the permanent per sonar box is located in our data center, we have lots of customers in our data centers, we have lots of, of rack space, and what ends up happening is somebody might say, well, I don't believe I'm getting 10 gigs or I'm getting the full bandwidth to my server. And so you don't know necessarily, just like how we discovered there was a bug between the, uh, the particular hardware, testing hardware, which is why we were seeing the 6.5 megs. Um, you don't know if maybe that one box has an issue. And so what ends up happening is we were able to deploy one of our super micros to the exact same switch that the gentleman, the researcher's uh, equipment was on in the data center, which is you know, 10 miles away from his desktop. And we were able to show, yes, you're getting, what, you're getting your 10 gigs because again, his uplink to the um, initial access layer switch, which is 10 gig was the slow point. So we were able to show, yes, from that switch, from that access layer switch to the exact same switch that his server was on was capable of 10 gig because that way we could say without a doubt, we know that you're getting the full speed that's expected. And then that's when we were able to figure that out. Um, but this also allows us to test just because there's a, a, a known, you know, we know that generally to, to this particular data center, we're getting 10 gigs. This allows us to go deeper into the data center and because we have so many customers, so many racks, you can't just deploy a per sonar in every single one. So this allows us to, to do that testing. Okay, and uh, that sort of concludes the case study and the uh, lessons learned and purchase decisions. Uh, I wanted to congratulate um, AJ and Marlon for helping us uh, they're the on-site Randall tech support, and they were instrumental in the triage of this. Uh, I want to also thank Jeff Hagley uh, for the bonded interface uh, work. He was very patient and made sure that all worked when, uh, when he heard about our difficulties with configuration. Um, and Katarina Thomas, as always, for putting together slides for us and graphics and making our presentations um, you know, palatable to the general public. Uh, I included a few links here. Um, the first link is uh, just a markdown document in uh, one of our repositories. Uh, and it has the P scheduler command that we run to do throughput with source and dest. So that way you don't need to, you know, provision accounts on a machine. Um, then let's see here, the Ansible playbook, I included a link to that. So that way, if you guys wanted to use that as a method for quickly provisioning test points, I, I find it to help in my work. Um, I've included a link to the limits tutorial. So if you want to either, uh, you know, increase test testing availability or decrease testing availability on any of your platforms, mobile or otherwise, that's a great resource. And I also included a, a link to the manufacturing specs for the Supermicro E308D. Once again, I'd like to point out that um, these are our experiences. Uh, the Super, like like Craig pointed out, the E308D is not the be all end all. You know, it does 10 gig. In our experience, we can get it to do 10 gig reliably. Um, it's not the highest speed. You know, now that there's 40 and 100 out there in a lot of people's networks. But to test to the edges where sometimes you only have one or 10 gig, 
uh, it is a very convenient, uh, cost-effective piece of hardware uh, for that sort of uh, testing environment. And I see that we have uh, a question and it wants to know is uh, if the E308D is rackable and works well for 10G, are there any benefits to using the bigger Dell servers in the data center? Um, the, larger data, the larger Dell servers have redundant power supplies. Um, they also have, uh, they're probably a little bit more future-proofed as well. You could, um, I wouldn't doubt it if we could get one of those big Dells to do 40 gig. Uh, 100 gig might be pushing it for their age, but uh, it might be worth a try just to see if we could still use that class of hardware. Um, the E308D, uh, if, you're, if you're strictly playing around in the 10 gig space, and you're not worried about super reliability with like dual power supplies, um, you might be able to get away with it. Uh, if, if I was only concerned with 10G testing and I was on a budget, uh, I wouldn't hesitate to try and experiment with these. It's a pretty convenient piece of machinery. Now we've also heard anecdotally that uh, people who have run super micros and other roles long-term um, they do say that, you know, maybe the Dell has uh, more longer term or less longer term performance issues. I mean, you're paying a little bit more for more expensive hardware, you'd hope so. Um, but uh, for, the, for the amount of time that these super micros are in the field and for the testing we're doing, that's not really a concern. If they can stay up there for a week or two while we debug issues, then they've done their job. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Ed and Craig. While we wait for other questions to get typed in, I actually had a couple more about the, the 300 AD because I, I had jotted them down, but uh, Brian beat me to one of them. Uh, so the first question is, does it have a fan? It has two fans. Okay. And then the second question is, uh, I'm guessing the power supply is on the inside of the, the device, or does it have an option to have the power supply live outside of the device? Good questions. So let me clarify. Um, when you buy the machine stock, it comes with two fans. Uh, uh, there is a upgrade option where you can purchase, I believe, either one or two more case fans that they install for you. Um, so it will be, you know, it'll have more cooling. That's probably a good option if you're running it in a data center. Um, now, uh, the, other question, the other question is about the power supply. Um, what is kind of, the power supply is external. Uh, it, it's a 12 volt power supply. I can't remember how many watts, but it's a, it's a decent size power supply. It's bigger, slightly bigger, then say like a, a Dell laptop power supply, you know, the, um, it's about 50% bigger than that. So uh, it plugs, it's got a, a cable that plugs into 120 AC. You know, the, the power supply itself is probably a world supply. It can probably go between 100 and 240 volts, but uh, we plug it into 120. It's got a brick and it's got um, a barrel, uh, um, you know, a cable with a barrel connector on the other end. The barrel connector does have um a you know like a lock like you can it 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 you push it in and then you tighten a locking mechanism so that you know if somebody's in the back of there they don't accidentally knock it out um what's really kind of cute is that the rack ears themselves because um because there's so much space between the rack posts and the machine uh the rack ears have a facility for holding that power brick so if you are using a two post rack mount you can put the power brick directly next to the machine, put that all in a one use space, and then you just have uh, your power cable coming out of there like you would normally. I haven't tried to run it off a car battery yet, but uh, if you were a really sick individual, you might be able to have really mobile personar in your vehicle, so. Okay. And another related question to that, since I still don't see any in the chat room. Uh, so I was looking at the specs here, 2.2 gigahertz, and that's perfect for sort of testing with, within the, the LAN and the MAN network. Have you tried to do long distance uh, 10 gig testing? I, does it basically have enough horsepower to, to be able to do something a little bit further away than five milliseconds? That's a good question. Um... 
that's a that's a deficiency in our testing. Uh, we have uh, we have um, we have not tried doing long haul testing with these. So that that would not we have them in the lab. We could do it. We could run a test right now if you wanted. <laughs> so yeah, I'd be curious uh, okay. only because we and, and it's been long enough that I've been away from Persona that I don't know if this okay. is still the case. But you know, it, it's one of these things where clock speed still is required to get to the high ends of, of of course 40 gig and 100 gig but uh for some 10 gig tests especially as the path goes further out uh it, it struggles a little bit you know it, i i i would just want to see if it was capable and if you're trying to do a live one here i'd say oh i don't know uh lbl dash pt1 dot es dot net now uh, the other now you you also mentioned something that I forgot to mention during the talk, and that's that um, the you're right. So we're our our main usage case here is short range throughput, and uh, you know we're trying to like verify close links. So this is kind of going to be an interesting test here to see how it handles long range. Um, I also wanted to mention that these are capable, perfectly capable of doing latency testing, but when you're running them in such a short range situation. Latency testing is is not accurate. I mean, your your packets are moving faster than your clock speed skew is. So that's why we haven't really addressed latency very much during this talk. One of the yeah, I that I wanted... go ahead, Greg. So I just also wanted to point out while this test runs, one of the biggest hurdles that we overcame um, was that the clock, the clock, since you mentioned the the time, the clock can have some drift, and so. If you're having issues with running it, you always want to make sure that you update it with NTP, which you can do through the Bastion server. Um, so that there is, it's not 110% perfect, um, but I just I wanted to throw that out there as a beware something that we found. I also want to point okay. out that these, that the the particular switch that these are on, it's running a um, it, it's running a uh, one gig connection, so we wouldn't be able to see 10 gig going off the box. Yeah, so um, you're right. So we've only got one gig connection to this box, so that's uh, that would have been an impediment, but it, we probably have some firewall or other issues because uh, it doesn't look like it was really super happy with that test. Now, the network these are currently on are a very internal test network. Um, we will put one of these on a uh, more public, less restricted network, and we'll run some 10 gig testing and we'll get back with you. That's a very good question. Okay. And Chris has asked a question. Uh, are you thinking about trying to do 40 gig with these boxes? Okay, so um, I should have I should have checked my notes before this because I should have known someone would ask that. I did the math. Um, there are enough PCI lanes in uh, on the bus to support the two by 25 card, which is aggregated like 50 gig. So uh, I looked at PCI cards for 40 gig and a lot of them have dual interfaces. So you have like, you know, um, you know, 240 gigs and they have certain PCI requirements. Now, when I looked into it, uh, it looks like if we wanted to drive a single 40 gig uh, interface, that would be possible. After all, we're pushing more than 50 with the 2x25, um, but it's, it's doubtful that it could handle uh, 240 gig at the same time. So that also supposes that you can find a 40 gig card that will fit in there. Um, so there. So these are, these. I imagine with some creativity and some work, you could get it to test uh, 40 gig, um, you know, if you found the right hardware recipe. Um, but you're not, I don't think that the vendor offered the two by 40 card because I didn't, I, I think that that would put forward the expectation that, you know, they drive uh, both both uh, interfaces uh, at their full capability, which in case uh, the, the PCI lanes, I did the math, it was like, they, they stop, they have like, you know, 50, 60, 65 uh, gig throughput max. So you're not going to get 80. Um, now, let's see here. 
Have you done disk to disk test on the super micros? Uh, now that would be interesting. Um, I think that would be interesting because they have very, very fast disk. Uh, we found that uh, in to support our researchers, the, the best disk to disk testing that we can do is actually using the researcher's own DTN because when you start to get past the network and into true disk to disk, um, you're looking at like, you know, their hardware configurations, the hardware configuration on the opposite end, what their storage strategy is, how all that's done. And, you know, I imagine that the Supermicro could do a very quick disk to disk metric, but unfortunately when we're looking at a lot of disk to disk metrics on campus here, uh, we're actually sort of forced to use their DTN so that way we can get their experience. Oh, okay. and we have a we have another anecdote. Uh, Paul Gunn says that they bought some of these machines and they've uh, or based on this motherboard uh, and they've tested them at full 10G, the length of the country. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, that is good to know. Uh, although New Zealand, while a big country, is not as uh, wide as others, so I. I think I'll, I'll message you offline, Ed, and give you some of the DES that testers to test against maybe into Europe, because I, I'd just be curious to see if they, they held up for that, because that's the, the, only, the, the only downside as I look at that is, yeah, I'd like to see the clock speed just a tiny bit uh, bigger than that. Um, and that may also impact uh, Chris's question about 40 gig. Uh, 40 gig would probably work well in a LAN environment. It probably would not scale at that clock speed to, uh, to leaving that. Okay, well, I'll put out another call for questions if anybody has them. Uh, the slides for this were posted into the, uh, the usual uh, locations. So if people are interested in getting the, the specific specs on those machines, they can certainly do so. Okay, and, and Paul clarified the specific one that they are using. Very nice. Gotcha. And it's a full thousand kilometers, like he said. So you know, you're not you're not going to go across. You're not going to go over yeah. the ocean, but like that's that's you know, that's yeah, that's it's like tw it's twenty milliseconds. That's sure a little a little bit longer. Could we point and, them at uh, the slides, please? Yes, I. Can. Yeah, uh, if you could just drop me. that into the chat room. Yes, I would love to. There is also um, if. Tommy, I'm going to go and grab this. I'm going to dump this in there too. Uh, uh, the first link on the slides is actually um, a document that I have in source control. Um, I'm going to show you. So the it's got all the links that are in the slides. Uh, the first link is the slides. Um, there is an example of the throughput command that we use so that you don't even need a command on the machine. Um, and I included Mr. Hagley's uh, if config CentOS direct directives uh, so that if anybody else wanted to play around with this, they could see um, the exact syntax that we use to, uh, you know, bond these interfaces. And I would caution you, you know, like, like Craig said, you have to prove to yourself that your diagnostic equipment is up to snuff. So if you, you know, I would, I would wholly recommend if you do any sort of configuration changes or bonding or anything, uh, bring it to your lab, make sure you can hit your targets. And then, you know, that way you're not in the, you know, non-enviable position of trucking server class hardware or whatever you got up and down, you know, uh, building stairs that are a hundred years old. So. <laughs> Craig, Craig's back thanks him for the super micros. <laughs> it was even worse than that because to do the initial back testing of that before we even brought them back here, they asked me to go test them at another location against the same uh, switch at another location about a quarter mile away. So I walked both of them over. Hmm. That was fun. <laughs> All right. Well, I had one more that I'll ask, and this may be open-ended, but sort of in the COVID era now that you have lots of people working from home, have you had to employ this over VPN or anything like that? 
Um, not yet. Well, we have but... not. No. Uh, we we have not because uh, essentially the VPN is more to get us to the border. Um, and then we have some stuff that's you know locked down to the VPN only, so you have to be on the VPN to reach particular equipment. But we haven't had any complaints from people um, that we haven't been able to pinpoint to other issues. Uh, you know, so some people say, "Oh, I'm only getting you know one meg to my server," and we ask them, and we find out that they they're on a DSL link, and one gig is their home connection, right? We haven't had to try to resolve any VPN specific issues with these, um, or we, we haven't really needed to do any testing um, in the COVID era because there's so few people in the office. So a lot of the, the speed so, issues can be pinpointed to other issues that we either can't or don't need to deploy these. The great irony to this entire process is that right when we got in our a uh, fleet of 10 extra. We, so we bought two of these for evaluation and then I bought 10 more for field deployments. Um, so we have six pair of these that are you know configured and ready to go. And as soon as we figured out how to configure them and what our best practices were, we were all banned from campus. So uh, as, as the COVID era starts to dissipate, we envision that this will be a uh, service that will get um, you know, as people start to experience networking issues in buildings, again, once they're allowed to go to buildings, this will pick back up, so. Yep, understood. And last comment there, Chris uh, noted, you know, that Celeron and Adams probably have the first power to do home internet connections. And yeah, that, that's probably very true, Chris. I would go so far as to say you should try a Raspberry Pi 4 if you're looking for something that can do a one gig connection. And that's the absolute cheapest we found to do a one gig. All right, well, thank you both again for uh, this talk. We'll make sure that we get this posted. Uh, if you're still listening, we are gonna be on a one week pause. So there will not be a talk next week but there will be a data movement and globus related talk in two weeks on the 16th i believe if my math is correct so i hope everybody has a good weekend and we'll talk to everybody soon thank you for uh allowing us to present jason we've really enjoyed it yeah no thank you thanks all thanks all thank you